there's always the possibility that the observation itself, the empirical data itself is false, not the, prop not the proposition. It may well be that the treatment of that data, the mathematical treatment of the data, or the staining of the data, if it's a biological sample, for example, the X-ray of the data, it, it, there are any number of problems that might occur with the data, not with the proposition. The background knowledge that is supporting the proposition, supporting the gathering of the data, supporting the treatment of the data, that these background assumptions may be false. So when Popper argues for falsifiability, falsifiability of exactly what? The proposition, the data, the theory, the background knowledge, it's, it's not clear. And that's, a, that's held to be a weakness in, in Popper's, uh, in, in Popper's um, theory. Um, and so Popper, uh, so Popper is in a little trouble with, the, uh, with many of the philosophers uh, of science. Um, the quine dewan thesis no, uh, argues at, at length about the uh, non-falsifiability of a proposition uh, as such. It argues that it's impossible to test a single hypothesis on its own since each one comes as part of, a, of an entire package. Each proposition is part of a package of theories. And we can only reject on, on this basis the whole package, not the proposition. So confirmation or negation here is a holistic, uh, a, a holistic affair. Um, the example of this that uh, has been referred to in passing uh, in this uh, class before uh, is uh, the example of uh, Uranus, the, pl the, the planet uh, Uranus, um, and the discovery of, of Neptune. Um, when it was found uh, that Newton's laws um, didn't apply uh, to planetary motion, um, Newton's laws were not rejected. The observational data was clear. The empirical data was clear. The planets were not behaving the way Newton said they should be behaving. They were not. And according to the empirical positivists, according to others, what should have happened at this point is Newton's theory be amended, altered, to take account of this new data, or maybe scrapped entirely. But, it, but that didn't happen. It was, shown, it was held by the scientists of the time that Newton's theories were more powerful than the empirical data, were more solid, more believable, had greater verisimilitude than the data. And so people looked to find what had gone wrong with the data. And, and sure, enough, uh, sure enough, they found uh, what, what had gone wrong with the data. The influence of another hitherto unknown planet was, was causing uh, the unexplained, uh, the, the unexplained behaviour. Uh, and, and we've also mentioned a similar case where <coughs> uh, subatomic particles allegedly travelling uh, faster than the speed of light. Uh, no physicist rushed to throw out Einstein's theory of relativity. Nobody did that. Everybody focused on what was wrong with the data. Nobody focused on what was wrong with Einstein's, uh, Einstein's thesis. So, so Popper's, uh, Popper's work here was, um, uh, was al also subject to the same sort of critique and the same sort of criticisms as he subjected the empirical positivists to. And, and you can see here Western modern science at work in, in the way it's contested, in the way it's argued, and, and the, way it's, um, the way it's battled out here. The inheritors of the tradition that we've talked about so far are the scientific realists. And I want to uh, finish today by taking you through an outline of scientific realism, the main uh, tenets uh, of scientific realism, and then tomorrow's lecture, 
I'm going to try to critique that. I'm going to try to undermine scientific realism. Now, while we have our cup of tea, I want you to thank you. I want you to think about and answer a question. Which of the which of these propositions for you has greatest verisimilitude? Which of these propositions for you comes closest to the truth? First proposition there is a reality which exists independent of our knowledge of reality. Okay. So this table exists regardless of whether I exist. If I shut my eyes, the table continues to exist. If we all die, the table continues to exist. The t reality exists independent of our knowledge of reality. Further, now that might not be so controversial, the next point is more controversial. We can know the table. We can know of the table, we can know about the table. We can know the reality that surrounds us. That's the first proposition. And if that one for you has the greatest verisimilitude, you're coming close to a scientific realist. You're closest to the scientific realist camp. The second proposition is that we do not know the table, we know of our knowledge of the table. We can only know what we know. We can't know the world as such. We can't know the external reality as such. We cannot know the other. We only know our, no, our own knowledge. Now, this proposition derives philosophically from the idealists, from the idealists who argue that what I know when I touch the table is the sense of touching the table. That's what I know. I don't know the table. I know what my fingers are telling me. When I look at the table, I'm not looking at the table. Photons, photons are exciting the rods and cones in my eyes. And what I know is the excitement caused by those photons as they strike my eye. I do not know the table. I know the photons. This is a phenomenological argument, an idealist argument that only ideas for us only ideas exist now you can be agnostic you can say maybe the table does exist maybe it does but i do not know the table i only know my what my senses tell me of the table i only know my knowledge of the table if you adhere to that school of thought you're coming close to a school that's referred to philosophically as idealism or some branches of phenomenology. The third alternative is that external reality and our, no and our knowledge of external reality produce one another. Now, it's un relatively uncontroversial from what you've heard so far, you'll know this, for me to say that my knowledge of the table is produced by the table. That my knowledge of chemical reactions are produced by the chemical reactions and my observation of the chemical reactions. Okay, so the world produces our knowledge of the world. But in this proposition, it's also our knowledge of the world that produces the world. It's, our, it's my knowledge of furniture that enables me to say this is a table. Otherwise, I don't know what it is. I don't know uh, what is this thing. You know, I need to have knowledge of furniture to have knowledge that this is a table. Sim similarly, 
you know, your own work in computer science, you, you need to have um, knowledge of logic in order to construct logic. A, a, a chemist needs to have knowledge of um, <coughs> elements and, and compounds and, and what have you, and that knowledge of those elements and compounds produces elements and compounds. Now, I don't just mean physically either. I also mean, I also mean um, in, in, a, in, a, in, an, um, in the sense of ideas. Now, if you adhere uh, to that third proposition, you are a, well, what's referred to philosophically as an adherent of material semiotics. Material semiotics. The materiality of the world and the semiotic part is the ideas co-produce one another. Okay, now, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up and tell me which one has greatest verisimilitude and maybe give my voice a rest and someone might like to uh, make an argument here about why they've selected the one they have. Okay. Can't all three be true in... You want to have two votes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can have... All right. oh, okay, okay. Elements of truth in yes. nature. Okay. Scientific realists, number one. There is an independent reality and we can know it. How important is it, the, the second... Uh, yeah, you picked up on a weakness in the way that I've proposed this. Would you like me to split it into two? I'll split it into two there. Okay. There is an independent, re there, there, there is a reality and it exists independent of us. It existed before we existed. It'll exist after we exist. It's just, it's there. Reality is there. Hands up, who, who says that? Mm, oh, <laughs> I'm surprised, okay. Do, those of you who have, the two or three of you who said that, would you go the next step and say that we can know it. No. No. Do you then adhere to this one that we only know what we know? We don't know what is out there. We only know what's in here, not what's out there. Is that what's your thinking? To a certain extent, we will be able to. To a certain extent, we will be able to. Sure. Okay. Anyone else? All right. We are bounded by the five senses. Yes. And there can be. That's. Yep. That's this view. Yep. We're bounded by the five senses. Yes. Who? Who? Number two. Who uh, f ha ha believes that that has the greatest verisimilitude? Comes closest to the truth. Number two. We only know what our senses tell us. Only one or two. Would you go so far as to be a, a, a solipsist here and deny my existence and say you, uh, the, uh, the only thing that we can know is what is inside my head? Would you go so far as to say that, that the universe, the entire universe, can, is comprised in my senses, in my cognition. That's a philosophical thinking in one really. Yeah. Yes. Okay, that's good. Number three, who, there's a lot of people who haven't voted yet, so I, I'm, number three would have to be the most popular, wouldn't it? <laughs> number three, that reality and our knowledge of reality produce one another. Hands up. <laughs> so, most people are not offering an opinion here. Okay. Maybe we'll come back to this question after discussing scientific realism, and I'll just see if at the end of this 